<laughs> Mickey Abbott is number one again, always number one. Wow. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me again this evening. My name is Dele Momodu and I'm expecting Chairman Mr. Akim Belo Osage to join me any moment from now. This promises to be one of the best, one of the best ever. Yes, I'm looking forward to having Mr. Akim Belo Osage live on Instagram this evening. We are family. Yes, let's have we are family. We are family. Okay, I've seen chairman. for joining us. I'm waiting for chairman to connect. Another phone. <laughs> yes, okay. Chairman is trying to connect. Yeah. What do I do here to say connect? 
Okay. Lad mig lade først. Sorry viewers, we are trying to connect. Uh, this can be a complicated process sometimes, so please bear with us. Oh, finally! Yes, 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 yes. I think we have chairman now in the house. Yeah. All right. Ah, good evening, chairman. My apologies. My apologies for delaying you. We had trouble with the other phone. Yes, I I realized that. But uh, better late than never. It's good to see you, yes. sir. Yes. 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 Great. You? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm telling you, are looking good as normal. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank yes, you, sir. Really are. <laughs> thank you, sir. And now it's my dear sister, Naima. Very fine indeed. Very, very fine indeed. My warmest regards to her. Yes, I was, playing, I was playing a song just now. We are family. Yes. So I've yes. been a member of your family for some time. And if yes. you remember, that was by Sister Sledge. You, you brought Sister Sledge for our birthday in Ghana many years back. I remember that. <laughs> you have a very, very good memory. Um, uh, I had a classmate of mine called Alan Heyman. Uh, he was my classmate at Harvard Business School, and he was one of the uh, biggest show promoters. Uh, so the very first time I took uh, Maima out on a date, he gave me free tickets to watch a show in Boston. And uh, the, 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 the people playing were Brothers Johnson and Sister Sledge. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that was our first day out to listen to Sister Sledge play. And that's the reason why when she was uh, celebrating her birthday, I think her 40th birthday, um, I brought Sister Sledge to Accra to play, uh, to remind her of that occasion. And I remember I, I, I'm, you were there as well. And I think we all celebrated together. Yes, I even invited them to my house in Accra. I hosted them. And you they did, were, you did. They said they you had something. They didn't want to go back to America. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's how Nigerians do the thing, you know. <laughs> you don't spoil people silly. <laughs> yes, yes, so good yes, to have you. Yes. So good to have you. Uh, I've said it countless times. You are one of my heroes. Uh, you are one man I respect so much. And uh, I want to place it on record publicly again. I want to thank you for your support, especially in my trying times in exile. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to anybody is to either be in jail or to be in exile. I experienced both, and you were there with me in exile. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, if, I can, if I can also add... Um, I also have to place on record uh, the great assistance, the great advice, and the great education you gave me. Uh, soon after my takeover of United Bank of Africa, I was totally uh, unaware uh, of the importance of the press, of the importance of communications. And if you recall, I was under a lot of attack from the Tribune and Daily Sketch and many other papers like that. And you kindly organized a meeting, which I was very reluctant to go to. You literally took me fighting and kicking. And I went for this meeting in Ibadan, which you organized. And you taught me the importance of being in touch with the press, explaining your point of view. Uh, do not look upon them as an enemy. And, uh, and, and, and you will find that you can develop a good relationship with them. So I think there are two of you who taught me a lot and were very supportive during that day yourself. And Unduka uh, Obaigwena, and uh, I'm deeply grateful to both of you, and I believe the two of you are very good friends as well. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Anything for you, anytime. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, I would like us to start. Uh, you are already 65 years old. At 65, yes. a lot of the young people are, are not likely to know a lot of the things you've done, not just for Nigeria, but for Africa and globally. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your childhood days, right from birth? All right. Um, I was born in Lagos uh, to uh, a, a doctor, a medical doctor, and uh, a nurse. Uh, both my parents uh, are from Benin, but uh, I was born in Lagos. And uh, my father had decided to specialize and become a gynecologist, and my mother wanted to become a sister and a matron. So we were taken to England uh, when I was a very young first boy, a child of about three years of age. And uh, uh, I was living in England with my sister and my brother until I was about seven years or eight years of age when I then came back to Nigeria. And on coming back to Nigeria, um, I started uh, primary school in Corona School and uh, spent a few years there. Um, I enjoyed myself very much there. Um, in those days, I would describe myself as a very shy and bookish person. I think one of my nicknames was Encyclopedia. And uh, I, left, um, I left Corona School um, having made um, very good friends, in particular Udoma, Udo, Udoma, who many of you would have heard about. Um, uh, people like uh, Benny Okagwe, Sam Kuki, uh, Rutini Dabri, Gustavo Beide, Aminu Yesufu, these were my primary school friends and mates, and went on to King's College, Lagos. Uh, King's College was very much a defining time of my life. It was a uh, boarding school, and um, I cherish it very much because it was an opportunity for me to meet people who were from all over Nigeria. And I, 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 I very much um, uh, appreciate having gone to a school where there were people from the East, people from the West, people from the North, Muslims, Christians, and uh, it enabled me to get a sense of the, of the whole country and was a very detribalized uh, place. Uh, many of my very good friends uh, come from my days at King's College. Um, I was very active at King's College. Um, I was uh, the head of the Students' Council, so I was uh, constantly uh, complaining or raising motions against the principal of King's College in those days. Uh, my first uh, business experience was at King's College, where I was a uh, general manager of the Coca-Cola shop. And uh, the person who worked very closely with me was Atidor Peterside. Wow. And our, our overall boss was Adebayo Unlesi, who himself reported to Ipehai Honkai. So when I look back at how all of us have fared, it's very interesting to note the, the background and the, how we spend those times. Uh, I was very active in the debating society and the quiz uh, team at the school. And of course, I was very active in the school band. I've always had a love for music. And in my younger days, I was actually a vocalist, something that a lot of my friends teased me about. And I would say the high point of our career as uh, members of what we called ourselves the King's College Hotspots was an occasion in which at the school dance, uh, Fela Anikolako Kuti was uh, invited to play and he very kindly agreed to uh, give us backing music while us small boys played three or four songs. Uh, my, my biggest regret in life is that there was no video in those days mm. because that would have been a video that I would have prized us with, with Fela in the background. I think I just released Joe and Koku in those days, and it was a hit. So I left King's College in Lower Sixth, and from there went to an international school in South Wales called United World College of the Atlantic, which had students from all over the world, and two very, very happy years of my life. And if anything, it just further deepened my view that it's important for people to be tolerant of people wherever they are, whichever religions they come from, whatever social class they are from. And uh, I left there and then started my, my university career. And uh, so where did you start from? Cambridge or Oxford? All right. Um, I started at Oxford University. I read politics, philosophy, and economics there. Um, I, I, I very much enjoyed those subjects. 
uh, you will not believe it, but my original intention when I was in King's College was actually to do a degree in mathematics. And, uh, but I, I, I got to uh, uh, Atlantic College and I found that there were people in, who were doing mathematics who were so far beyond me that there was no way I was going to be able to make my mark in mathematics. And a teacher suggested to me, uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, 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 maybe you should do something like politics or something like history. You seem to have a strong interest in that area. So I, I did politics, philosophy, and economics. And uh, my classmates, uh, or who were at Oxford with me, uh, again, Udoma, Udo Udoma, Bayo Bunlisi, again, were together. Uh, Mr. Ike Osakwe, and then Mr. Febi Ogusongo, who became a very famous journalist. We were all there together. Mr. Dafe Otobo, who became a, um, a, uh, a, a, a university professor. And then people like Stella Amakris, Carol Suzo or Fabri, those were my, my mates and friends there. After uh, Oxford, I then went to Cambridge and did a law degree in Cambridge and um, very much um, uh, enjoyed my time at Cambridge. I must say that I preferred politics and philosophy to law, but I thought that law was important to understand. And I am very pleased that I did my law because it's been very helpful to me in understanding the legal frameworks um, of any of the business or political situations I have been in. And uh, after that, I then went to Harvard Business School and did my MBA. Uh, Bio Gunnisi was at Harvard a year ahead of me. Um, there were not many Africans at uh, Harvard Business School when I was there. I think I was about the only person in my class. Uh, but there were some Africans who were at the law school and uh, in other areas. And so there I met, uh, and I had people like Louis Edozian, who was a good friend um, at that time. Uh, Ngozi Edozian had just left Harvard, but was at MIT. So we were in, 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 in good touch with each other. Uh, Chinwe DK was also there at the time. And it was at uh, Harvard Business School that I met my uh, wife-to-be, Maima, who was uh, who's from Ghana and who was then studying at Harvard Law School. Um, after I did my special paper on the international oil markets at Harvard Business School, and I was extremely fortunate um, that um, I was uh, able to get a job in Nigeria in the oil sector of the uh, country back in 1988 um, as a special assistant uh, to the presidential advisor on petroleum and energy, um, a, a man called Yahaya Diko. And uh, that was the start of my uh, six to seven years of government work uh, in the oil and gas sector, which I had always had a dream of being in. And I was very, very lucky to be able to get that dream. Fantastic. Fanta growing up, who were your heroes growing up? Um, well, my heroes, um, I, I would first of all talk about my, say, my uh, international heroes. Of course, um, a young person like myself, who were very much inspired by uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, um, the great um, American uh, 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 political and protest leaders uh, who had such a big impact on us. They were the people I, I really looked up to. Um, then I would say I also very much looked up to, uh, you, know, you know, at that time, uh, some of the great leaders like uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, who one had heard um, about the stand they had taken against apartheid and how they had, were still in, in jail, still fighting for apartheid, and people like Stephen Biko, who sadly died while he was in detention. And then, of course, I would say uh, 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 a younger, uh, 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 other people who, may have been forgotten, but people like uh, Sheikh Abdel Zaki Yamani. He was the Saudi oil minister, um, a brilliant um, Harvard Law School educated oil minister who did uh, a lot in ensuring that uh, people in uh, Africa, in the Middle East, that we got more of what we deserve to get uh, out of the oil industry and was at the center of the negotiations between the oil producing governments and the um, and the um, oil companies. Um, uh, uh, going, to, going to Nigeria, I have to say that uh, as a young person, one of the people that I, I would say I very much admired in Nigeria uh, was uh, uh, General Gowan. Um, and I, I very much uh, uh, was very uh, enamored 
by this young man who was only 32 or 33 years of age uh, when he became head of government of Nigeria and had the task of uh, trying to bring the country together and had the task also of, um, of um, ensuring that after the civil war and um, that the, there, were, there were not too many reprisals and that uh, we all as a country you know, came together. Um, in many respects, I think that uh, General Gowan has not been given sufficient credit uh, for his achievements. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the decision, the ill-fated decision uh, to postpone a handover date. But I think that history will be kind to him in the sense that I think his government, in many respects, laid the foundation for the for Nigerian infrastructure and in, uh, in, in peace within the country. And then, of course, um, um, as a young man, I very much looked up to uh, some of the great civil servants of those days, um, Abdelaziz Atta, um, Alison Ayida, Philip Asiodu, um, who um, in those days were very, very strong and powerful civil servants, very highly educated, and who were very much at the forefront of, um, of developing um, a greater Nigeria. So those, I would say, were very much uh, my, my role models. Um, then when I started working, obviously um, um, you, have, you have people who are your mentors, who you learn a lot from. And uh, I would say that uh, for me, two in particular stand out. Uh, one, Yahaya Diko, uh, who was my boss as petroleum minister. Um, he was an incredible person, uh, very intelligent, very clear mind, extremely hardworking, and a very simple and unassuming person. Um, who uh, uh, didn't uh, like the limelight and, uh, and, and behave always with great modesty. And I think he's had a very big impact on me because I very much liked to behave the way he did. He was not showy. He was not uh, noisy. He was not arrogant. He was a very simple uh, person. So I, he was very much a big mentor to me. And then the second mentor is uh, to me in business, um, I would say was a young, was, was, a, was a very interesting person who sadly died at a very young age, a guy called Ali Udasuki. Um, and um, he was a businessman who had this company called Old Trade. Um, and uh, and um, I, he taught me a lot about, uh, about the business, uh, business world. The one thing I will always remember saying of his that he always used to repeat to me was that, Kim, it's always important in life that you think big. You must always think big. Because the deal that makes you $100 million, the deal that makes you a million dollars, and the deal that makes you 100,000 Naira, each of those three deals takes exactly the same length of time to complete. Mm. But, and you can suffer the, the same amount for each deal. Whether for 100,000 Naira or for a million or for a million dollars is exactly the same level of suffering you're going to go through. So if you're going to go through hell, you're going to go through suffering, and you're going to work like mad, make it for something that is large, make it for something that is big, and then it is worth your while to struggle, to sweat, and to suffer, and to enjoy it when you succeed. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Yes, yeah. before we continue, uh, just along the line of what you said about being humble, and I got yes. a message from a gentleman in the United States earlier today. Uh, his name is Ademola Olukotu. And he asked me to read his message to you. Okay. It's, Good morning, sir. I worked for Etisalat for five years before leaving Nigeria. My memory about chairman, HBO, still lingers positively till today. As a young man, always going to his office to set up his devices and madame's devices, Blackberry, data cards, and other mobile services then. There was yeah. never a time I got to chairman's house that I wasn't offered drinks, food, etc. But of course, being a professional that needs to face his duties, I always turned it down. I would never forget when I informed madame, Mrs. Maima Bello Osagi, of my wedding coming up July 28, 2012. After setting up a device this fateful day in the lovely lawn garden, I got a surprise envelope, which I never expected. 
1,000 US dollars. Shama <laughs> <laughs> also in his always serious voice congratulated me. My little conversation with chairman for a few minutes is always fully packed of wisdom and knowledge that still helps me till today. His humility and Madame's humility is unbelievable. I am looking forward to listening to chairman this evening. So I'm sure he's watching. <laughs> well, please, uh, if I can send him my very best regards, I trust <laughs> that he continues to be uh, happily married. I, I, I'm delighted to hear that he is in the United States and doing well. And uh, again, I'd like to thank him for the patience he showed with us because I continue to remain technically deficient. So he must have been very patient in explaining to me how it worked. So I thank you just, for his patience. Just comment now that he's here. He's watching. He's watching. Very good. Very good. Then. Very good. I just seen the message. Great. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So also growing up, you see, if you look at my uh background here you see loads of books uh yes. i wanted to be a teacher so i started more as a scholar uh yes you tell some of uh, the authors or the books that really impacted your life yes beyond um, what you studied. beyond beyond what you studied in school were there books that you would uh, remember as impacting your yes. life Oh, definitely. Um, I, I must say that the books that have influenced me the most um, have tended to be biographies, biographies, um, and, or biographies and autobiographies. Um, and um, and um, um, the one, one, I'd like to, one I'd like to talk a lot about is by a man called David Halberstam. David Halberstam. He wrote a book entitled The Best and the Brightest. And this is a book, it's a book about a lot of very famous Americans and um, about their lives and their careers and how they tried to wrestle with the problem of the Vietnam War and how so many of them failed. Uh, what is fascinating about the book is that on, the, on, on, on one level, it is a book about a very impressive group of people when he tells you what they had done. Like there's one man he describes uh, called Robert McNamara. He had been a brilliant academic at Harvard University you know, Business School. He had uh, worked during the Second World War uh, in the United States Army trying to show how statistics and data can help the United States uh, war effort. He then went into the motor car industry and became president of Ford Motor Company. And from there, he became secretary of defense during the Vietnam War and eventually became president of the World Bank. And um, so on the one level, this book tells you a lot about people and their motivations and what they had done and, and not done. But on the other hand, it also tells you how despite all that collective brilliance, how they made big mistakes and how they failed mm. on the issue of Vietnam. So it had a huge impact on me in the sense of uh, giving you um, encouragement to do your best and to work in different industries. You don't have to be limited to only one, but at the same time to also remind you um, that however uh, academically able or intellectually brilliant you, you think you are, all right, that people, far more able and brilliant than yourself have failed in things. And sometimes it's because there are important issues of uh, culture, you know, it's important issues of understanding society that they never grasped and therefore didn't understand. And sometimes it's because they have not listened enough to other people who had certain insights that you did not have or that they did not have themselves. So I think that uh, David Halberstam's Best and the Brightest you know, was a great uh, you know, you know, influence on me. And another book he wrote called The Children, which is a book which talks about the young African-Americans who fought for civil rights. Uh, they were university students. They were in their 20s. Uh, they walked into restaurants uh, to try to have them desegregated. They were beaten up by the police. They were taken to jail. They would come out of jail. They'll go back again to be beaten up again 
until they made the point that there's something wrong with de desegregation. And I think that one of them uh, just passed away two days ago, two or three days ago. Uh, we have uh, an internet issue there. I hope it's also not a phone call. Uh, I pray. Still, uh, he has to come back again. Uh, so we are still here, fortunately, uh, because we are recording. This is. Uh, more than a master class at Harvard. So uh, we'll try to bring Chairman in again, and then we hope it will be very smooth this time. Waiting for Chairman to come back in. Uh, good evening, the Dame Senna Tassin. Yes, one of the big, big posters at the Emirates. So whenever I fly Emirates and she's on board, we always have a good time. She looks, she takes good care of us. Good evening, good evening. It's good to see you. I hear you've resumed your flights to uh, London now from Dubai. So we hope Africa will join soon. Hey, my boss for life. Uncle Mike, I will invite. Good evening, sir. That was my boss at the Weekend Concord newspapers. And then I can also see who else am I seeing here? So many people. Wow, wow. I'll be back to recognize you all. Thank you. Chairman is here now. Mm. Okay, I can Steve. Steve, bye bye. Eko, Tokumbo Kuti. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. Yes, Chairman. Good, good. My apologies. My apologies that we got cut off. Yeah, no, we got cut uh, off. We need to centralize your camera, sir. We're not seeing your face again. Yes. We okay. need to have you at right the center. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah, that's better. But if there is more light, uh, your face looks a bit darker now. It was brighter yes. before. Yes. If we could have lights focused on you, sir. Yes. Okay, then. Yeah, okay. Yes. Is that better? Uh, yeah, if you centralize your camera, it's still a bit dark, but we can, yes, we can make do with this. Thank you, sir. Yes, okay. All right. I must say, I, I always admire your, your home. Beautiful, beautiful home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, sir. So, 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 so we're talking about the books. That, so David yeah, Halpern, the child, the, 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 the children, um, and then and then those are made a very big impact on me. And then of course there were a whole uh, uh, a series of other books, uh, 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 biographies of um, uh, Charles de Gaulle um, called The Edge of the Sword, a uh, huge impact on me. Um, and um, and um, and then I, and then of course. Uh, uh, looking at uh, Nelson Mandela's uh, book where he talks about his own life. I, 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 I forgot the exact title, but it's his, auto, it's his autobiography and it's a very moving it, it, autobiography. Walk to, the Long Walk to Freedom. To yes. Freedom. Yes. Oh, yes. I think those are some of the books that have had a very big impact on me. So were you in tune with the politics of the First Republic in Nigeria? Was I? In tune with the politics of the First Republic, when you had the Aula Wars, the Aziku Wave, very, so. very, yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. I was very, I was very fortunate because uh, my father was a gynecologist. All right, and uh, he was. Uh, there were not that many Muslim gynecologists in Lagos at the time, and so many of the northern politicians uh, yeah. ended up being treated by my father as their gynecologist. All right, and, uh, and and therefore he was gynecologist. To... Center, sir. Sorry, sir. Center, center. You are too much at the edge now at the center. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. 
yes, and, uh, and and therefore and therefore he he, he was a gynecologist to the family of Balewa, uh, Shagari, uh, Ribadu, Inua Wada, uh, uh, Nuhu Bameli, a lot of the ministers at the time. So I found myself in very much um, as a young child uh, aware and knowledgeable about First uh, Republic politics. Um, well, of course. Uh, at that age, you all read Azikiwe's speeches because, I, because Azikiwe uh, was very much the uh, it was president of the country, very learned. He used to uh, make these very uh, uh, great speeches, uh, a supreme command of the English language, um, and very much the nationalist. Um, and then, of course, one was very well aware of the fact that there was uh, this uh, 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 big regional divide uh, between North East and West. And, and, and therefore, um, a lot of that First Republic was the juggling between those, um, you know, th those three centers. Um, there were, in those, as young people were aware of a lot of the complaints about corruption, though I must say that when you compare what we used to complain about as corruption in those days, it pales into insignificance, all right, when you compare it to what you know, sadly, we have seen in the last uh, 5, 10, 15 years. And when you really think whether it is uh, Dr. Michael Okbara of Eastern Region or Amadou Bello in the North, uh, when, you, when, when you come down to think of what they left behind or, 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 or what they left their families, you realize that they were in many respects, you know, very selfless uh, leaders. Um, so... I can still remember in 1966 when there was the coup d'etat. Uh, I was in my very first year in, in King's College and we suddenly heard that the prime minister was missing, possibly assassinated. Um, there were, there were uh, uh, lots of uh, officers killed and uh, 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 no one knew where we were going to go. Um, at the beginning, there was great celebration because everybody thought that the military was going to save us uh, from the corrupt civilians. There was lots of excitement. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, things began to have like a tribal uh, interpretation. And then um, there was a big counter coup. And uh, there was that very depressing breakdown in, uh, in, in, in relations in the country, massacres that took place in various parts of the country. And then by the time I was in my second year, we started the civil war. And I must say that civil war, I'll never forget that civil war because we came back from one uh, long vacation and suddenly one third of King's College did not come back. Mm. And so you would, I can still remember the beds of the Eastern region students who, had, who, who, who went back and, and didn't come back. And uh, it was a very, it was, I felt a great sense of sadness um, that, uh, that we had degenerated you know, into civil war. And so for me, uh, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we must never, ever, ever uh, get to that stage where ethnic hatred or ethnic bitterness is ever so bad that this country has another civil war. Um, because that period was terrible. I think close to maybe a million people lost their lives, either out of starvation or out of the, or out of the war. And... Um, and um, I think we must always be conscious of the fact that uh, many of those people who shouted the most and who, 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 who in some senses, um, they spoke the language of war and battle and fight and the rest, uh, many of them um, escaped. And uh, it is a lot of innocent people who suffered and who lost their lives um, following one side or another side. Yeah, it's surprising that our leaders at that time patronized yes. local hospitals, patronized yes. indigenous doctors yes. like your dad. So yes. what do you think went wrong? Uh, I think another, a number of things uh, went wrong. Um, number one, I think that um, when, when, when I look back in those days and you compared the compensation of the salaries of a medical doctor to what, say, a member of the Senate or a member of the House earned, or what a doctor earned compared to the CEO 
of a bank, they were not that different. Mm. They were all around the same level. The CEO of the bank didn't uh, make more than, what, 20% maximum, more than a senior specialist, doctor. Uh, over the years, uh, doctors and nurses have been very, very poorly paid. And, uh, and, 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 and that has led to an, a massive exodus to the United States, uh, an exodus to, to, to Middle East, an uh, exodus to Europe of, so, of a lot of our best talents. That's the first problem that has gone wrong. And then the second thing that has happened, I think, is that um, we have just not been spending and spending wisely and, and uh, efficiently uh, uh, money on hospitals, on medical training, um, on uh, 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 um, outpatients, uh, and on smaller hospitals that uh, could give service to people in the smaller towns and the smaller villages of the country. I mean, I can still remember being on British Airways just a few years ago, and um, an air hostess came up to me and just asked me if I was Mr. Bellow Saga, and I said, yes, I am. And then she was very excited. She said that she had looked at the manifest and saw my name, and she had uh, uh, called her mother because she said that she was born in Lagos, Nigeria, at the Island Maternity Hospital at Campbell Street. And she always remembered her mother saying that there was one Professor Bello Osage who delivered her, and that, uh, she, had, that she had wanted to go back, her mother had wanted to go back to England to have the baby, but uh, her mother said, no, she wasn't going to go back because there was this Dr. Bello Osage and there was this hospital called Island Maternity that was just as good as a place in England. And then uh, she, she said, she called her mother and she said, oh, well, ask him if he knows the man. And I said, yes, that, that's my, that was my father. And she was very excited. And uh, she looked after me very well throughout the flight. Um, and I, when I got off the flight, I kind of reflected that, see how far we have come today, that here we are, uh, uh, most Nigerians, a lot, a lot of well-to-do Nigerians, don't have their children born or the babies born in Nigeria, um, let alone an expatriate who had the choice of whether to go to London or to many Nigeria. But there was a time at which we had hospitals and we had uh, outstanding doctors and we had the equipment sufficient uh, that a person who was a foreigner felt comfortable having their baby in Nigeria. A lot has gone wrong. And um, uh, I must say that just watching television over the last couple of days, hearing about what has happened in the NDDC, hearing about what has happened in the Northeastern Development, Corporation, uh, Development Commission, it just makes one wonder um, well, if money was voted in these commissions ostensibly to do our best in ensuring that those affected areas uh, could, uh, could have roads, could have uh, water, could have electricity, uh, could compensate them for oil spillage. And, 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 so, and you hear what happened with the money, it makes you wonder who knows what has happened in the Ministry of Health. Um, has money in the past been voted for hospitals and not been spent in the way that it should have been spent? Wow. You see, for an interview with chairman, we we'll need about 10 hours. But today, we're trying to get at least two hours. So, and time is going very quickly. So, I will touch on the different subjects. Yes. The next one I want to speak about is that, did your education prepare you ideologically? And will it be right to say it prepared you for the world of capitalism? Um, um... I would, I, would answer, I would break that question down into three sections, into three questions. Um, when we talk of ideology, I would say that I was very fortunate in that the specific people who taught me politics and philosophy, and those who taught me law, the teachers that I had, the tutors that I had, were tutors who I would say were definitely on the left side of politics. 
all right? So without a shadow of a doubt, there were people who basically believed that ultimately politics and, and, and a functioning economy uh, and law, laws are judged predominantly by how does it affect the bottom 40% of the population, all right? And that if, if a society uh, cannot be organized such that economic benefits go to that 40%, it doesn't really matter how many millionaires or billionaires are created, that society has failed. And therefore, the societies that are to be um, respected are those that are able to, 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 to satisfy the basic needs of that bottom 40% of the population. So I would say that my education, certainly in politics and philosophy and in law, did prepare me for thinking about such issues. So, so that, that's one. Um, I would also say that business school was very helpful in reminding me that however well-intentioned you may be, there's a need to run organizations efficiently, all right? And there's a need to be able to do that um, while making, well, at the very least, covering your costs, all right? If not making a reasonable profit. And that a society cannot exist continuously always by subsidies. Now, however much or however famous a university you have gone to, the fact of the matter is that that university is in a society very different from your own. So without a shadow of a doubt, when you do return to your own country, there are many things that you haven't learned. There are many of the problems that you don't understand. There are many of the ideas that work elsewhere but don't work at home. And therefore, um, there's a need for, for you to continue to learn when you come back and not have an attitude that you have all the answers. So uh, my education didn't prepare me for those kinds of issues, uh, but that's, and that's the reason why I very much salute uh, a lot of people, um, uh, Mike Lauren Femi, Igwe Mwokedi in NNPC, who I learned a lot from, Dr. T.M. John, who I learned a lot from, who had um, built refineries in Nigeria, uh, who had built petrochemical complexes in Nigeria, and who really had a good understanding of how uh, you execute and how you, 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 you succeed in projects within, within Nigeria. Uh, I still think that the, there's, we have a fundamental problem in our politics is that it is still a competition between elites and elites who are essentially trying to accumulate as much for themselves as possible. And, and, and what it should really be about is what are the different solutions that we have to, to ensure that you know, the driver's son or the, or, the, or, the, or the farmer's son is able to get a good education, uh, is able to be part and parcel of, uh, of an economy that assures him of a, of a decent job, whether it's in the manufacturing sector, whether it's in the farming sector, and, uh, and how we put all of that together uh, in a country that looks more like uh, a South Korea, looks more like a Malaysia, uh, 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 as opposed to where we are today, in which um, I think there's one statistic that shows that Nigeria probably has more people be under, under the poverty line than almost any other country in the world. That is a very sad statistic for us to be associated with. And therefore, when I look at countries that have done extremely well, um, um, yeah, I, mean, I very much uh, look towards uh, Korea, I look towards Malaysia, and of course, one has to look towards China, which has done a phenomenal job at lifting something like, I think, four to, four to 500 million people out of poverty in the last 20 to 30 years. Sorry. Don't you think the problem with Nigeria is that we are trying to practice capitalism without capital? Um, 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 I would say that uh, I would say that the problem I wouldn't say the problem is that we're trying to practice capitalism without mm. capital. I would just say instead that um, I don't think that 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 capitalism without the 
regulatory restraints is a system that we, we should follow. And I think that, yes, uh, capital has its place and capital needs to be rewarded. Uh, but I very much believe that, um, that, that human needs must stand you know, at the very center you know, of development. Um, and, and I do very much believe that uh, all societies, all, all its citizens, certain basic economic rights, whether it is uh, the right uh, to have education, whether it is basic electricity, whether it is uh, uh, water supplies, whether it is uh, three square meals a day. And therefore, we need an economic system um, that while rewarding those who have capital, at the same time, uh, take into account the interests of the, of the huge proportion of people who are poor um, and, and, and need certain uh, facilities to be placed at their disposal. I don't believe in the trickle-down theory. I don't believe that um, if you allow rich businessmen to do what they want to do, that, that they will employ people and everything is going to be okay. I think that uh, uh, businessmen, wealthy businessmen, are regular human beings. Um, they will act in their own interests. And, uh, and therefore, it's a necessary part of government uh, to regulate, um, uh, to ensure that there's sufficient spending uh, for those um, uh, millions of people who are, who are not so privileged. Wow. Fantastic. So I think now we'll uh, move on to what I call your adventures in power, business, and then uh, philanthropy. Now, we would have to start from when you returned to Nigeria under the Shagari government. Could you tell yes. us about that? Uh, a fascinating time, as I said, um, as I've often said, uh, the best thing that can ever happen to you is to have an outstanding boss who is psychologically secure and therefore gives you an opportunity to develop yourself and takes you as a son. I often say that uh, your first boss is either your second father or your last nightmare. Um, I was very fortunate in that my first boss was my, became my second father. Um, it could not have been a more exciting time because uh, uh, 1980 when I returned, we had just had the second oil price increase. The price of oil had moved from two to about uh, 13 or $14 in 1973. And then it had moved to about $40 in 1980. Uh, the exchange rate between the dollar and the Naira was around one to one at that particular time. Um, when we consider that today it's 470, I guess for lots of young people watching this program, the notion that at one time the dollar was equivalent to the Naira must uh, seem very bizarre. But um, um, at the time, I think the major uh, issues that we had very much there was uh, one, um, uh, how do we develop our gas? Um, and uh, how do we take, uh, how do we ensure that the liquefied natural gas project uh, takes off? Um, we had had one or two failed attempts. And so a lot of my time at that, during that period was how could we uh, get that project uh, relaunched? And uh, I'm very proud of the part that I, I played during that time. That's one. Uh, the second thing that was important at the time was um, uh, how do we achieve oil price stability in the marketplace? And um, it was uh, be beforehand, uh, all the oil producing uh, countries could just produce as much oil as they wanted. Um, we were then in a situation of big oversupply and therefore we had uh, uh, prices falling and during that particular time uh, was the first time in which we had to now, uh, as OPEC countries, come together uh, and agree on supply and agree on restrictions in supply so that supply and demand balanced and so that we had more stable prices. So a lot of what has happened in the last uh, one or two years uh, within the oil markets of having to agree quotas, uh, this first started in the early 80s, and I was very proud to be part of that government and putting together you know, part, of that, uh, part of that system. Um, 
I would say that uh, the National Petroleum Corporation was much smaller then uh, than it is now. And, um, and um, in, in fairness to them at the time, um, they did complete Kaduna refinery on time within budget. Um, and, um, and, and while I was there, the beginnings of the launch of the new Port Harcourt refinery also uh, occurred um, at that particular time. Um, in 19, December the 31st, 1983, we had a coup d'etat. And um, I, I still remember that very clearly. I, I, was, uh, I left the country uh, on December the 31st. It was my first holiday with my then uh, girlfriend, who, Maima, who I later married. And uh, we arrived in Abidjan. And I woke up the next morning to find out that there had been a coup in Nigeria. I was very fortunate not to be in the country because um, all special assistants, uh, special advisors and ministers, uh, and I was a special assistant, had been asked to report to the nearest police station. And um, had I been in the country at the time, I would have been in Kirikiri for the next 20 months of my life. So um, I was very fortunate to have left on that particular day. Um, I, 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 I was to my surprise and uh, as a result of a number of, um, shall we just say, accidents and luck and goodwill uh, from certain friends, um, I was reappointed under the, the next government, which was a Buhari administration, funnily enough. Uh, I was reappointed to my old position as special assistant to the Minister of Petroleum, and my second boss was uh, Professor David West. Um, oh. So um, I, um, I, I, it was a very, it was a very strange time because you are in a government in which all your colleagues are in Kirikiri, are in a detention, and you're in a sense regarded as part of the old guard. Um, and um, it was a very interesting time and, and uh, a difficult time. But in that sense, I learned a lot from that because, as I think uh, you yourself, Dino, have learned as well, it's during times of adversity that you learn a lot of lessons. Uh, they oh. toughen you, um, they make you more thoughtful, and, um, and, and they strengthen you if they do not break you. And, um, and therefore, um, uh, it was during the, the David West and Buhari time that, um, that we, we did a lot of work, again, on the fourth refinery and making sure that that took off. Um, I stayed on in the government until another coup, uh, the Babangida coup, and um, I had the opportunity of joining that government as well. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, um, after two coups uh, and getting married, um, I think I took the decision that, you know, maybe this is a good time for me to leave the government, uh, 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 go into private business and, uh, and, uh, and, and see how that went. So I retired from the government at the age of about 30 or 31, um, a, rather, a rather young age to leave and, and uh, took the decision that I will, I will see what the business world holds for me. Sir, oil is very, very important to Nigeria. Yes. Why is it that oil refinery, just for us to have oil refineries to refine our own oil, has become rocket science? Um, I... I, I don't think, you, you're, you're very right about that. It should not be as difficult as it was. Um, if, I should, if I'm to try to explain it, um, I would put it in the following way. way. Um, one is that uh, over the years, over the years, um, NNPC, um, I think, has become more and more politicized. That's number one. Um, I think that over the years, um, we haven't really been able to ensure that a lot of very, a lot of our ablest people um, who should have been recruited to NNPC, who should have had promotions that have been meritocratic, that has not happened as much as it should have happened. And I think that over the years, for a lot of people, especially in the political class, uh, they have just regarded it as very much um, a money machine. Um, um, I, 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 sometimes, uh, uh, I sometimes feel sad for a lot of the NNPC officials because a lot of them are often maligned and are often treated as if they are the quote-unquote the thieves who have been enjoying, whereas in actual fact, in a lot of cases, um, the political appointees have done far worse 
than, than the Korea and NPC you know, officials. I think that um, the first big mistake that was made was when a decision was taken at some point, which was that those uh, companies who are responsible for building the refineries uh, often usually had um, responsibility for handling the maintenance of the refineries. And they often unusually virtually ran the refineries with the NNPC officials. I think that when that decision was taken, and it was taken at some point, I think late, uh, uh, I think it, I think it, I think it, that, that came during the Abacha period. I may be wrong about my timing of it. But when that decision was taken, um, that, that, that they don't repair the refineries, they don't maintain the refineries, and then we started giving the maintenance of refineries to companies that one had never heard about, had no clue what they were doing. And, um, and, um, and, and they just failed. And after a while, you could not but begin to believe that maybe there was some nice arrangement between those people who are supposed to be maintaining the refineries um, and, um, and, um, and, and certain individuals uh, who clearly were benefiting from the fact that the money was being voted to maintain refineries or not being maintained. And over the years, they started, they, their, their production dropped, uh, capacity dropped, production dropped. And, um, and uh, as years went on, you had uh, fewer and fewer people uh, remaining in NNPC who had, most of them had never built a refinery themselves. Many of them had never even worked in a refinery that was itself working. And therefore, over time, um, you, you probably uh, have large sections of the refineries division of the NNPC today. And, I, and I, I suspect that there are many who have never really themselves, as I said, built a refinery, worked in a refinery themselves. And if you, if you now tell them or ask them uh, 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 to sort out this problem, the honest truth about the matter is that the cumulative experience is no longer, is no longer there. Um, um, I think that uh, we Nigerians, we do have a basic problem in running state corporations. Uh, we tried it with banks, um, and uh, that is a role that I played a, 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 a big role in. And state banks, we failed. Uh, I'm not saying private banks have been fantastic, but I think private banks have certainly done better than state banks have done. Um, and I think that it's going to be very difficult to restore amongst uh, Nigerians uh, a sense that state corporations are to be run efficiently and honestly, and that an appointment to a state corporation is not an opportunity to simply take money out, as we have seen in the hearings of the House or in the recent conflicts of NDDC and, and, uh, and other institutions like that. That's right. So from government, uh, what was your next move? Uh, 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 um, I, I then, I, I, then uh, I, I considered for a period um, working with my uh, very good and close friend Udoma Udo Udoma. Uh, our original plan was to uh, set up a law practice together. Uh, so that was very much my backup plan uh, for, for during my time in government. Uh, my wife um, uh, uh, is a lawyer and uh, a far better qualified and far more able lawyer than myself. So I very wisely um, uh, uh, altered that plan and she and Dama ended up uh, uh, setting up a law firm together, uh, which, has been, which has turned out to be a truly outstanding law firm. And um, I decided that I want to try my hand at business. Um, while I was in the government, I had seen that there were certain gaps. And that is that a lot of oil companies uh, private companies uh, who wanted to do business with the government of Nigeria often didn't know how to go about it. Um, they didn't know where the opportunities uh, lay. Um, I had had uh, experience working in the government and I had, while at business school, studied uh, a lot of uh, areas in the oil industry. And, and, and I said to myself, that let me try and establish uh, a business that basically advises a lot of government, a lot of 
uh, oil companies, American oil companies, um, Japanese companies, uh, European companies, and let me work with them and uh, enter into the oil sector. I was one of the very first in that sector, and I must say that it was a very um, exciting time for me. Um, after, uh, I, was, I think I was there for close to 10 years, um, very fortunate to have been paid well, I must say. Um, but after a while, I must say that I did start to get a little bit bored, uh, mainly because um, as uh, in those days, uh, you were very much an advisor, you were a consultant, you were an agent, uh, but you were never really uh, in charge yourself. Uh, because at that point in Nigeria's history, it was very much the NNPC and the big international oil companies. Uh, this was pre-Mike uh, Adenuga, it was pre-Ocean uh, and Oil, pre-the um, privatization of the oil marketing companies and the oil producing countries, companies. And so I saw an opportunity in, in finance, and that finance was the area in which um, uh, 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 the Babangida administration was deregulating and liberalizing and allowing private people uh, to get into the kinds of areas that were hitherto reserved uh, for the government. I think that uh, President uh, Babangida uh, is often not given sufficient credit because I think that um, his abolition of import licenses, um, his liberalization, uh, his deregulation, and his privatization, I think. Uh, made a tremendous difference to Nigeria and gave uh, a large number of opportunities to a lot of people today who we hear about today are successful. And without those changes, I don't think the Nigerian economy uh, would have been as successful as it was for a period of time. And I don't think, and I think that we would have been mired um, in the, 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 the rot or the difficulty of a completely government-controlled uh, economy, which would, I don't think would have been uh, good for Nigeria. Uh, my very uh, first yeah. venture in finance, I must say, was a big failure. And uh, one of the things I always uh, I do talk about is um, the importance of failure. Um, and uh, it went wrong, and uh, I blame myself for a lot of those mistakes. Um, but my second venture, um, FSDH, uh, was, a, was a big success. It was a securities trading company. And it was from FSDH that I then launched the attempt to take over UBA, which I often say made me either famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, and was when you and I met. Yes, uh, okay, I was going to say that a lot of people still blame the IBB regime uh, for SAP, and you know yes. there was own riots. Yes. So how did we then reconcile that with uh, the liberalization being a good thing. Okay. Um, uh, I think that, that when you assess any Nigerian leader, uh, you have got to, um, you've, got to, you've got to see it on the background of what was happening to oil prices at the time. All right? Um, the fact of the matter is that during most of uh, Babangida's uh, re uh, regime, um, the price of oil was at about eight to ten dollars a barrel. Uh, during the Shagari administration, the price was somewhere around forty, went down to about thirty, uh, and then the price of oil collapsed. And if the price of oil, which is ninety percent of Nigeria's foreign exchange, if it collapses, a government doesn't have that much leeway to maintain the exchange rate. What will inevitably happen at that time is that you will see the Naira being devalued. And I think that, um, uh, 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 yes, there, maybe there's some things that uh, uh, Babangida might have done a little bit better, but any government that that, that, that was there at that time would have had difficulty avoiding austerity during a period at which Nigeria's revenues were cut by at least a third. We are, at the, we are facing right now a problem that is not that different. All right? 
Um, the oil price at one time was, I think, uh, it was about $100, $80. Uh, at one time, it went up to as much as $120 to $130 a barrel. Uh, the price then went to about $60. Uh, a few months ago, it was close to zero. Uh, zero. We're, now, we're now talking of about $30. And, um, and I think that it's important that when that happens, governments have to take very clear and bold decisions. What is going to happen to the exchange rate? Are we going to be able to maintain an exchange rate that is the same exchange rate as when the price was, say, a hundred, you know, you know, dollars a barrel? Um, at that time, we'll, we have to start taking decisions as to what do we spend our money on. Certain things you will not be able to spend your money on that you 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 could you could before, and uh, you then have to start thinking about how do we. Uh, attract foreign investment, given that internally we may not have the capital that we that we, that we require. So, so, so I think going back to 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 Babangida, uh, yes, um, um, there was uh, uh, suffering during that period. Yes, things were tough, uh, but we have to ask the other question, which is the following: If there was no deregulation, if there had been no liberalisation, if there had been no ban on import licenses. And if we had had a government-controlled economy during that period of time, would the economy have been any better? And I would say that I think that the, the general direction that he took was, was, uh, was, uh, was better. Um, there, were, there were mistakes made, yes. They were, they were uh, some things could, that could have been done in a more efficient and more effective way. Yes, um, corruption could and should have been reduced, but the general direction was one that I think was best for Nigeria. Okay, sir. What happened at UBA? You faced a lot of blistering attacks. Yes. And uh, it's like they fought you to stand still. Yes. Yes, I, um, 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 for me, you see, um, United Bank of Africa, for me, and the, the, the issues that I faced there, in many senses, they were a microcosm of the problems that Nigeria faces as a nation. Um, it was a state-controlled bank. And I remember very much the very first uh, couple of months, uh, weeks when I got into the bank, when we got into the bank, um, we found out that every branch outside of Lagos was losing money. We found that, that, that um, um, there, was no, there was no computerization in any of the branches. The average, the average size of a branch was about 100 in terms of personnel. So each branch had roughly 100 people. A branch. We found that there was very little money available for training of staff mm. there. Um, we had more clerks than we had qualified accountants in the place. And, and, and probably about 80% of the revenues of the organization were going to staff salaries. The bank, for all practical purposes, was bankrupt. And when you're in that kind of situation, you know, there's no point continuing in that direction. But of course, you will, you will find a lot of people who will tell you, no, don't take radical action, uh, don't take tough action, take one step at a time, you know, softly, softly, and so on and so forth. But, I still remember a professor who said that um, sometimes, you know, you are walking down and you have a gutter in front of you and that there's no point having the view that you should take one step at a time and walk straight into the gutter. Sometimes you have got to leap and take a jump across the gutter and that's the only way that you are going to survive. Now, the fact of the matter was that United Bank of Africa at the time could not sustain a workforce of eight to 9,000 people. It just could not. And anybody 
who thought that it could is just not being sincere. And therefore, we had to cut the stuff by half. And my rationalization was sometimes you have to cut stuff by half in order to save the jobs for 4,000 people who can continue working there. You've got to reorganize uh, your, the existing stuff you have, bring in stuff that um, have very good skill, have skills that you require uh, for uh, much more modern banking, while at the same time understanding that there's some of your existing staff who have not been trained, who have not been recognized in an old order, and who need the opportunity to be trained and need the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to be given an opportunity you know, to, to thrive. Uh, my, 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 the ultimate justification for me is the following. United Bank of Africa, at the time when we started, um, had a stock market valuation of about $15 million, $15 million in US dollar terms. That was the value of the bank, ascribed by the TCPC, the privatization committee at the time, roughly 15 to $20 million. And I accept that valuation, even though I know that at the time when he took over, it was bankrupt. So it really had a zero value, frankly speaking, but it was 15. Now, at the time when we sold the bank, its valuation in US dollar terms was somewhere between 200 and $250 million. So, so, so for me, if you take stewardship of an organization, and over a seven to 10 year period, you manage to multiply its value by somewhere between 10 to 20 times in US dollar terms and put it on, on a safe footing when it was bankrupt. I think that justifies the very tough and severe action that you took. And when you consider the fact that some of the other banks who are competitors who did not take these actions, and I look at Union Bank and Afri Bank, in particular, those banks collapsed and went bankrupt. And so um, I say I, 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 I give this example because I also think that the government of Nigeria, as a government, also needs to take very tough decisions and very tough action as to what it wants to do in what sectors. And there's no going away from that, from those decisions. Whether it's the central bank, whether it's the NNPC, whether it's NDDC, whether it's, uh, it's any of our parastatals, whether it's confronting the issue, can the government of Nigeria run on the basis that its recurrent expenditure on salaries is probably, I don't know, somewhere between 80 to 90% of revenues? Is that sustainable? You know, can you continue to borrow your way out of things? And, uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's necessary for um, our government leaders um, and our, our senior leaders in the private sector to confront uh, these very, the tough situation we're in, take tough decisions, be unpopular for a period of time, knowing that that, believing that with the right measures that that will take uh, the country to a much better situation that we're in right now. Well, fun. so fantastic. I think um, one of the other areas that a lot of people have expressed interest in is the situation at Etisalat. Yes. First, uh, why did you go into telecoms? Uh, what I, influenced I, 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 I think that I went into telecoms because I think that telecoms... Uh, is going to be a, is te te the telecoms and technology areas are the future of the country, um, and I think that um, if anything, the pandemic uh, is simply going to accelerate that. Um, I think that uh, the mobile phone um, is going to be a key instrument in development. Uh, I think that people can delay it, but whether or not you talk about medicine education, you talk about uh, uh, finance, uh, all of those areas are going to be revolutionized by what happens in the telecommunications and the technology spheres. Uh, substantial changes are going to be needed in those areas, um, and all of them are going to center around how we deliver uh, 
far more efficient services at much lower costs to a broad mass of the population using uh, a, a different uh, network and, and, and doing away with the bricks and mortar that has been the basis of those sectors for the last 50 or 60 years. So what went wrong at this All right. Um, I think that... Um, that um, two things went wrong at Tisalat. The first was that the fall of, in oil prices led to a collapse in the exchange rate. Um, the exchange rate moved from somewhere, I think we were at uh, one time we were about 120, 130 uh, Naira to the dollar to somewhere around, I think it was 250 to 300. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, because the um, telecoms company had pursued a very aggressive expansion policy, that is, uh, we wanted very much to be the most efficient, the highest quality network, and I think all would agree that we did achieve that, it meant that we had borrowed a considerable amount of dollars in order to finance that expansion. Our revenues were in Naira. So the drop in oil prices, the collapse in exchange rate meant that we now needed more Naira to, re to repay the dollar loans that we had taken. Now, that created a crisis between the banks and the telecoms company. The, 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 the banks, quite rightly, wanted a repayment of the loans that they had given. From the point of view of um, the telecoms company, um, they felt we had we've expand, we've expended a lot of our own equity in this drive. We have paid all our loans up to date. Um, banks have earned close to a billion dollars in interest payments over the years. We have not taken any benefit for ourselves and therefore they wanted the restructuring of the loans. Now, to me, it's one of the sad things that between the banks and between the telecom communications companies, we could not agree on a restructuring plan. Because I think that what happened after that was the worst thing that could happen, which was both the banks and the telecoms companies lost money. The banks rejected the proposals made by the telecoms companies, which they had every right to do, and took the decision that they were going to take over the company themselves, ask the Arab investors to leave, and they were going to run it themselves. Now, uh, my own view is that that was probably a mistake, all right? Um, and that it is very difficult for a set of banks to run a telecoms company. They don't have the expertise to do so. But at the same time, I would also say that they were within their legal rights you know, to do so because the bank had not, the telecoms company had not met its financial commitments. But I do think that uh, people have learned from the lessons of, of, of the mistakes that were made. Um, I noticed that um, the, the oil price collapsed again um, in the last one year. The exchange rate has dropped again. And this time round, I've noticed that um, the Central Bank of Nigeria has come out uh, encouraging um, a lot of the banks to restructure the loans over a longer period of time and has uh, given them assurances um, that, um, that they will not have to make uh, the kinds of provisions that they would be expected to make if we had a very um, uh, harsh implementation of the prudential guidelines. 
So I think that um, the, the similar situation today is being handled much better than it was handled uh, 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 two years ago. So I think that's what, that is what went wrong. I think that the company today, uh, which was taken over by the banks, and I think later on sold, um, I, I, I think remains in a precarious situation. Um, uh, my, my view is, honestly and sincerely speaking, is that I think that the banks and uh, it is a lot and the Nigerian shows that we should have come to an agreement. And I think if we'd all come to an agreement on what is to be done, I think we'd all be better off now. If given the chance, would yes. you still want to go to the comms? I never look given back. The... I never look back. I never look back. And, and, uh, and uh, I think that um, my attitude is a look. Um, you, you are in different phases of your life. All right. Um, if your question is, if I would I go back to telecom is very unlikely. Um, I'm in the phase of my life very much now in which um, I'm very much enjoying the stage of my life of being an academic. All right. Doing some business, but very much uh, teaching and doing research. And um, I, I genuinely feel that at 65, you're supposed to be encouraging young people who are in their 30s to be making their mark. And, um, and in a sense, um, not remaining until you're carried out on a stretcher, so to speak. I think you'll be able to write a PhD thesis on the Nigerian factor. Could you give us a synopsis of the Nigerian factor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, would say, I, I think I, I can just give you a few glimpses of some of the things I would write about. Um, well, certainly, um, you, you have to talk about the, the undue influence of government. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that that is a problem and it's a factor and it's a thing that we should have less of. Secondly, you'd have to write about the personalization of a lot of government decisions. That you'd have to talk about. Um, you'd have to talk about how I think us Nigerians need to learn to cooperate and, and, and indulge in much more teamwork you know, than we do, than we do. I think that, um, uh, the, that, the, that the ability of Nigerians to collaborate could be much better. And in, in, in so many areas, I think that there's often a, 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 an unnecessary battle or a fight to finish, which ends up with everybody losing out. I think that definitely will be there. Um, I think that um, um, a section of it will be on how we need to give young people and, uh, and women more opportunities than they are given right now. Um, and that uh, in particular, we need to recognize that it is young people who have the boldest ideas, who are most adventurous, who are thinking differently, and, um, and they need to be given leadership uh, at a much younger age than, and than, than they are receiving uh, right now. Um, I think there will be a chapter very much on how um, I believe, and I think that when we're UBA, we succeeded in it, which is that it is quite possible to build companies uh, that are ethnically diverse, because um, my view is that intelligence is equally spread uh, across races, across religions, um, and therefore it is very possible uh, for for able people of all ethnic groups to work together well, and, and we need to do more and more of that. And we shouldn't take the present abuse of federal character to be the last word on diversity uh, in our companies. So those are just a few glimpses of some of the chapters that I intend to write on. Fantastic, fantastic. At 65, Chairman, you are in yeah. semi-retirement. Yes. Uh, are you not, is that not like an advice to leaders in Africa that at 65, no matter who you are, you begin to decline and you must allow others to come up? All right. I'll answer this question in two ways. Am I saying that everybody over 65 has nothing to offer? No, I'm not saying that. All right. Um, I look at the example of Nelson Mandela. Uh, Nelson Mandela emerges 
I think he must have been in his 70s when he emerged. Definitely. Yes, he emerged in his 70s. He played a very critical role in his country's history. And, um, and um, that role uh, was historic. And I'm not sure that it could have been achieved in the peaceful and splendid way in which it was achieved without his presence. And therefore, I will never say that people over 65 must be excluded. But I think that Mandela also um, tells us something as well. Because when you look at the two or three people who were very close to him or who, who were his principal lieutenants at the time, Thabo Mbeki, Cyril Ramaphosa, there were people who were in their 40s and their early 50s. And the fact that after one term, he stepped down for a younger generation to take over, that speaks volumes. And to me, it says something about what leadership should be like, what mm. leadership should do. Um, when, I, uh, when I look at people, uh, I think that, let's face it, in your 30s and in your 40s, your attitude to life is very much, why not? What can go right? That is your initial approach to things. And you, you are obviously more daring uh, you don't see hurdles. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that as of necessity, when a person gets to their 50s and their 60s, whereas before, when they're saying why not, they're saying why. Yeah. Right? Whereas before they're talking about what could go right, they are now asking the question, what could go wrong? All right? They are of necessity more cautious much more, much more risk averse, um, much uh, more out of tune with the latest thinking and the latest uh, technology. So, you know, I do think that um, Nigeria in our government, in our politics, in our, in our businesses, we need many more people in their 30s and in their 40s playing key roles because I think that in many senses, they are not hampered uh, by a lot of the personal quarrels, the personal envies, the thinking of the 1960s and the 1970s or the 1980s, and, and they're part of a, of a newer world, and they should be given a chance to, 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 to make their contribution. I think that for us who are in our 60s and our 70s, uh, yes, there's a role to be played. Some should be playing a, an active role, but I think for a, a lot of us, it should be to share our experience. It is to guide. It is to advise. Um, and um, uh, but 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 I do think that um, when I look at uh, Barack Obama, I look at Tony Blair, I look at uh, uh, people like uh, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, um, uh, uh, and, and you see how. How, how, how young they were, um, it tells you something about, you know, the kind of society Lickly. that yeah. we should have, or Bill Clinton. Um, yes, um, in China, we do have a lot of leaders who uh, made great contributions in their, in their 60s and in their 50s. Uh, they, they, they did, they haven't, they've done that. So um, again, I make the other point that they should not be excluded. Uh, would you recommend that government should begin to consider more technocrats in power than politicians. It seems uh, the propensity for stealing is forced by what politicians go through before they get power. And two, a lot of them have never managed people and resources. If a man has never managed one million and you give him a 10 trillion budget is likely to run mental. Don't you think so? Uh, yes, you've got a good point there. Um, what I would like to say is that, you see, that word technocrat is a word that is often used in Nigeria. Now, I want to break it down. What exactly is a technocrat? 
yes, a technocrat is supposed to be a person who has certain technical skills or technocratic skills that he has. And his life and his career have been governed, influenced by applying those technocratic skills. And, and that's really what you mean by a technocrat. But I must say to you that I find that I've come across a lot of people who describe themselves as technocrats. But for all practical purposes, behave exactly the same as politicians behave when they get into power. All right? They may have at mm. some point been uh, great engineers. They may have at some point been, you know, bankers, great bankers. They may have at some point have been great accountants. But when they have been on the seat of power in government, in some cases, you don't really see how they have been different from those people who have been lifelong politicians. So therefore, sometimes I think that the, the, the distinction between technocrat as opposed to politician, it's a distinction that doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, rather, I would, I would rather simply say that what Nigeria needs good and able people who are patriotic, who are honest, who work hard, who are intelligent, who are thoughtful, and who are committed to the country. Some of these people may be lawyers, some may be doctors, some may be uh, 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 politicians, some may be members of the House of Representatives, some may be uh, 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 technology people, and, 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 we, and we just pick those who um, can, can, can do a job properly. Um, but, you know, I have seen, I have come across people that I expected a lot of and who, quote unquote, were technocrats. Okay? And I've seen them get into office and commit atrocities while there. And, and so that's why I, I don't like to say technocrats as opposed to politicians. I would simply say that um, let's have, let, let, let a president of, of Nigeria pick individuals from all over Nigeria who are able, who are, who are talented, um, who uh, are, are, are honest, and who will work very hard for Nigeria, and who when they so, show signs of failure, they show signs of the abuse of power, they show signs of corruption, uh, uh, he need, they need to be fired, uh, they need to be removed, so that the lesson is learned that you can't rest on your quote-unquote technocratic background. You can't rest on the fact that you delivered a state or you delivered a local government in an election or that you were loyal 20 or 30 years ago, but that instead you will be judged by um, your performance on the job that you are given by a president or a governor. Now, uh, there is no way we would conclude this conversation without talking about how you and your wife, Auntie Maima, uh, you've contributed immensely to charitable causes globally. I would want you to tell us some of your interests, uh, maybe from Oxford to Yale to Harvard to South Africa. When I was uh, reading about you today, I was, I was really touched. Uh, all right. Uh, I must say that, um, that um, it's something that I don't like to talk about, but, um, but Dele, you're one of the few people that I can't say no to. Um, I don't like to talk about it because I just feel that there's something about talking about what you have given, talking about what you have done, that sometimes I just feel sounds very boastful, all right? So let's just say I will just talk about some of the contributions I've tr my and I have tried to make, and I will not give any numbers at all in the discussion. I think, I hope that's a good compromise. All right? Yeah, that's fine. Um, that's fine. Okay. Um, I think that in the area of medicine, we are both children of gynecology professors. And I think that maybe for that reason, we both have a certain guilty conscience about the fact that none of us ended up being hardworking doctors like our fathers were. 
And maybe you can say that we have tried to repay that debt by a certain interest in medicine. And, um, and therefore, um, we've supported efforts and research efforts in areas like uh, infertility, in um, blood banking, especially during the period when HIV was very rife and in which there was a lot of um, transmission of HIV uh, via blood that had not been screened uh, mm. for HIV. So I think we, made, we, we, we did a lot of work in that particular area. Um, a lot of work also in areas like artificial insemination. And uh, that was, again, allied to the work related to the stuff on infertility, which is just beginning to understand the things that childless people go through in this country and seeing what could be done in, 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 in helping solve some of those, some of those problems. So um, efforts in gynecology is something that Maima and I have been very much involved in and associated with. And um, we also, in our own quiet way as well, also try to make efforts in, in equipping and supporting uh, medical efforts uh, in responding to the present COVID pandemic as well. Then I think we both have been very much blessed with um, an education that within Ghana and within Nigeria and within the United States and within England um, has been a very privileged education. And therefore, we have, and, and we have both seen the impact that that education has had in our lives. And, and in that sense, we have both very much wanted to ensure that others benefit from that education, that kind of education. So uh, at both uh, King's College and at Chimota, uh, at the University of Ghana, uh, at um, the United World Colleges, which I went to myself, at the African Leadership Academy, at Oxford University, at Harvard Law School, um, at the Africa Center for Harvard University at Yale, we have always uh, 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 made contributions. Uh, sometimes it has been to research. Uh, sometimes it has been to uh, physical construction. Sometimes it has been to scholarships. But we've always tried to make contributions for Africans um, and for those institutions to be involved in whatever way they can in making a, a better Africa. Um, um, I think uh, these days, the area that I'm very interested in, 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 in getting involved in and in which a lot of my um, teaching and research is going to be involved in, it is in the relationship between knowledge and action. And, and I, use, I, I talk about knowledge and action because I think that one of, the, one of the central problems that I think a lot of our governments have is that a lot of decisions that are taken, especially in, in government, are decisions that are taken without the necessary research, the necessary thinking, the necessary analysis being done as to what is the problem, how is it best solved, what policies should be put in place, how should, is it best executed? And, 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 and one of the things that I'm fascinated by is how do we ensure that decision makers have the benefits of the best information, the best research, the best analysis uh, that is available? And how, do, therefore, do we, put, do, we, do we collapse that relationship between knowledge and power? Because the most sophisticated and the most successful countries in the world have been those countries that have united knowledge and power together and therefore been able to devise successful economic policies that have double standards of living for millions of people. Well, uh, the final questions I will merge into two. Yes. And uh, that would be that can you tell us how old boys' connections are how? Fair? Old boys' connection. Old boy connection have helped in your trajectory. 
Yes. And if you are thinking of doing an autobiography or a biography, we must have a book from you very soon, Chairman. Yes. yes. All right. Um, have old boy connections, but of course they have worked. They have been very helpful, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, without uh, without um, people I had met in uh, Corona School, King's College, Lagos, United World College. So, for example, um, the Itisalat investment was an investment of between one to two billion dollars. That investment started with a relationship I had with a classmate, with a schoolmate of mine at sixth form at United World College, who also became a classmate at Harvard Business School. And it was the trust and the relationship that we had that led to $2 billion worth of investment of United Arab Emirates in Nigeria. I don't think there's been any substantial Middle Eastern investment in Nigeria since that particular time. Or anyway, nowhere near that kind of amount of money. So do these relationships matter? They matter a lot. But of course, they have to be positive relationships in the sense that you mustn't go to a, you mustn't go to a school and people remember you from school as a person that you should never do business with. Um, people, of course, have to remember you fondly. So the All Boys Network does help. Um, and then the second question about a biography, uh, an autobiography. Yes, I, I, I do intend to write. Um, um, I, I want to write uh, when I'm a little older, I think. Um, I want to write a book that is frank and is, uh, uh, says things as they are. Um, and, and therefore, maybe it should be, maybe I should have uh, two volumes. One volume that um, describes what happened and what my experiences were. Um, uh, and uh, it should be published while I'm alive. And maybe there's a second book uh, which goes, which, which, which says things that maybe shouldn't be said and maybe should be published after I pass away. That's, that's interesting. Uh, on this note, Chairman, I must say a very, very big thank you uh, for this special lecture. It's a special lecture. And uh, I cannot thank you enough. And uh, my warmest regards to your family. Definitely, uh, we would have to invite you again at some point uh, because this should be like a lecture series. Uh, our young ones need a lot of information about so many things and uh, because of the collapse of education it has become difficult for them to learn these things locally except they go to privileged schools which most of us cannot afford so thank you so much sir and uh, if, I, I wish if, if, I, if i can say uh, if i can say up to you i would also like to thank you for the honor of inviting me over uh, it has been a pleasure um, i would like to uh, thank uh, to thank you and to recognize, uh, let's just say, your indomitable spirit. That is that you, you, have, you, have, you have kept going. And at each mm. time you've surprised people. I think Ovation was a first um, in the country. And, uh, and I, 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 tru I truly respect the fact that you, you started a magazine that we, that the, in, where there was nothing at all similar to it within our country. And I think it's um, I think ovation is something that um, has surpassed its equivalents in England. Hello and okay, and uh, and it, it became something that everybody wanted to appear in. Um, and 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 the, the the thing that I very much admired about you is that you've been able to, on the one hand, you've been able to do um, a society magazine, all right, that looks at the society part of life, that looks at at whether it's weddings, it's birthdays, it's people in very happy moments. And on the other hand, I can pick up the newspaper and read you on a Sunday discussing what the Buhari government should be doing, making a commentary on what Obasanjo is up to, discussing you know, the economics of, um, of, um, of, our, of, our, of our country, and you are, you are able to, to, to do both. And uh, in both cases, I, I, you know, I, I learned I learn a lot from you. 
So I just want to let you know that as you are waiting for my memoirs, I shall be looking regularly to your articles and being guided by some of the very useful and fruitful things that you say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Chairman. I'll be joining back at 10 o'clock. And good the joining will be Dr. Babatunde Ajibade, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, a presidential good. candidate uh, at the Nigeria Bar Association. Thank you, I Chairman. Wish, I wish all of the Bar Association all the very best. Thank you very much. Good thank night you, and bye-bye. And thank you to the thank audience you. as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir.